Almost universally, ancient texts and traditions, they've told us that everything and everyone is connected through this mysterious web or net of energy. In this episode, we'll explore what the largest and most complex machine ever built is discovered about the fractions of a second immediately after the Big Bang. I think the experiments are fascinating, but what's even more fascinating is the scientific thinking that had to change to reflect what the experiments have shown. Here's what I mean. In 1887, physicist Albert Michelson and chemist Edward Morley, they attempted for the first time to describe once and for all if this mysterious field actually exists. This is the very famous Michelson-Morley experiment that I mentioned in the last episode. It was performed in the basement of Case Western Reserve University in Ohio in the United States in a very nondescript building where they built a device that is called an interferometer. Now, the image that you're seeing on your screen is the interferometer, and I'd like to take just a few moments and explain to you what it is that they were doing and what it is that this experiment revealed. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you're seeing a source of light. The light is being emitted. It's moving to the right toward a mirror on the right-hand side of your screen. However, to go to that mirror, before it can get there, it must pass through another partial mirror. It is called a half-silvered mirror that allows some of the light to continue to the right and some of it to be reflected to another mirror at the top of the screen. So the one beam is being split into two. Now here's the thinking. Michelson and Morley proposed that there is a field of energy that surrounds us. It permeates the universe. It is everywhere all the time, and they believed that the field is in motion. They believed it's moving. And so their thinking was that when they shoot a beam of light through this field, if the beam parallels the movement of the field, it's going to move quicker and it will be unimpeded. If the beam is perpendicular and it has to move through this field, it's going to be slowed down just a little bit. And when that beam is reunited with the original beam, it will create an interference pattern. So let's go back to the image so I can share with you what I mean by this. So we're seeing the beam, it's coming from the left, going through the splitter. One of the beams is going straight, one of the beams is going to the top. Both are being reflected back to the center mirror, and that reunited beam is now going to a detector, okay? In the detector, the scientists are looking for signs of the interference pattern that I just mentioned. In the experiments, they found no interference pattern. Now, in a very, very simple way of thinking about this experiment, if you and I were to go outside from whatever building we're in right now, and we had a piece of tissue paper, and we held that tissue paper in our hand, and in the moment we held the tissue, there was no movement in the paper. And if we assume because the paper is not moving, that means there is no wind. And if we assume because there is no wind that no air exists, of course we know that that's not true. The air exists whether the wind is moving or not. But this is the equivalent of what Michelson and Morley, what they believed this experiment was showing them. Because they saw no interference pattern, they said, we detect no movement in the field, therefore the field must not exist. In order to explain the phenomena that are being seen on the quantum level, in order to explain the phenomena that are being seen on the other side of the universe relative to where we are now, science must accept a deeper connection. And it's for that reason, 1986, 1986, the Michelson-Morley experiment was repeated. It was repeated under the auspices of the United States Air Force, same experiment. They had much better equipment. And you'll never guess what they found. The field exists. The 1986 experiment demonstrated that the field that can no longer be called the ether, it exists and it exists precisely within the parameters that Michelson and Morley had predicted 99 years earlier. What happened was when Silvertooth replicated the Michelson and Morley experiment, he found that interference pattern. And what you're seeing on your screen right now is an image showing 
the light without the interference pattern on the left and with the interference pattern on the right. So you can actually see what this interference pattern is all about. So version two, Michelson and Morley, provided the first scientific evidence for this field. But it's also raised a lot of questions, new questions. Now that we know this field is out there, scientists can stop asking themselves, is it there? And begin answering the deeper questions, what is it made of? And how does it work? How do we relate to this field? What does it mean in our everyday lives? Well, the attempt to answer these questions has led to the largest research project ever conceived in 5,000 years of human history. It has led to the greatest level of scientific cooperation, global cooperation, using the largest and the single most complex and sophisticated device ever built by humankind. Of course, I'm talking about the CERN Superconducting Super Collider. I had the opportunity to, to visit CERN myself in uh, 2017, and I want to share with you a little bit of my experience and, and what I discovered. Uh, it is an amazing place. Uh, and I think that we are not really hearing about some of the very, very powerful discoveries that are being made there and what they really mean to us. I've spent a lot of my adult life studying ancient and indigenous traditions. And although, as I've said, they're not always science, a lot of those traditions give us tremendous insight into what science is revealing in our world today. In the Hindu traditions, for example, the creation deity, uh, actually three deities, uh, Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the maintainer, and Shiva. And Shiva is typically described as the destroyer, although if you go into the Hindu traditions themselves, Shiva is not so much about the destroyer. Shiva is the transformer or the regenerator. So the particle must be destroyed before it can be transformed or regenerated into something new. So it's not the destruction in the sense that everything is just gone. What was once present is destroyed to reveal something deeper. And I'm sharing this with you because at the CERN facility, the country of India donated the image you're seeing on your screen right now. This is the image of Shiva, the transformer, the regenerator to symbolize what it is that's happening at the CERN superconducting, super colliding laboratories. And I think this is fascinating that we see this. So the question, what is it that's actually being transformed, as Shiva is saying, or, or regenerated? Well, I'm going to talk about the field. Before I do that, we're going to talk just a little bit about some really basic physics and where we are in the world right now. When I was in school back in the 1950s, 1960s, early 70s, I was taught that the atom looks like what you're seeing on the screen right now. And it was things moving around the thing, particles called electrons that are moving around the, the nucleus. And this is the model that has gotten science so far. However, it is also the model that's breaking down because we now know that the atom doesn't look like this. The atom is not things moving around things. And this model of, of the electron, the proton, and the neutron, as well as it served us, technically, we know it is no longer true. The atom is made of fields of energy, pulsing, vibrating fields of energy that are concentrated in some places more than others. But this new model, this vibratory model of the atom has given way to the particles and the subparticles now that are so complex and so numerous, they're actually called the particle zoo. When we look at what is now called the standard model of physics, you're seeing it on your screen, what you see is that there are some particles that are related to matter, some particles are related to force, and some are theoretical, such as the Higgs particle. And you're seeing it in a gray box. It's got a circle around it. The Higgs particle, if the standard model is accurate, if it works the way we think it really works, then we should be able to find under certain conditions this Higgs particle. And if that particle is there, it's going to open the door to even deeper questions, but it's going to give us a lot of answers at the same time. The question that the physicists are asking, is there an ultimate particle that is the fundamental particle for all things? Well, I'm going to come back to CERN now. CERN is recreating the Big Bang to answer this question. It's not so much about the Big Bang itself. 
that primal release of energy, it's what happened just fractions of fractions of fractions of a second after that release happened. As the universe began to expand, something began to change. And certain particles that were created in that release did things that cannot be accounted for right now. Some of the particles slowed down, some of them continued moving at the same speed, and signs are saying, why? Why would some particles slow and some particles continue at the same speed? Why would some particles begin to have mass and other particles not have mass? Well, the current theory is this, that there's an unrecognized field of energy that was responsible for those changes. And that field has been known uh, as the Higgs field in honor of the creator of the theory, his physicist named Peter Higgs, who's still with us today. On July 4th of the year 2012, science at CERN made an announcement that absolutely rocked the scientific community. They announced that through one of the CERN experiments, they had discovered a new particle and it was in the mass region precisely where that Higgs particle was predicted to be by the standard model. They'd never seen it before. So they said, if the standard model is, is working and we collide these particles and they break down into their elementary constituent particles in the area of a certain energy level, we should see something. That energy level is 126 giga electron volts. They'd never looked there before. And when they made this discovery, lo and behold, there was a particle with precisely those characteristics, precisely where they had predicted it was. It is now called the Higgs boson, the Higgs particle. So the properties of this Higgs boson are precisely consistent from where Peter Higgs had predicted. Well, this is important, and this is where it gets really, really interesting, because for the Higgs boson to exist there must be a Higgs field that it is emerging from. The Higgs field is the elusive field that we're gonna be talking about throughout this program. The Higgs field has now been validated. The Higgs field is believed to be the field that scientists have been searching for for three centuries now, since the time of Isaac Newton. The ether that fills the empty space, it's now accepted that this Higgs field is the field that exists everywhere, all the time. It's what gives particles their mass. So at the time of the Big Bang, just after that primal release of energy, when those particles were created and they began to expand, it is moving, because they're moving through the Higgs field, that some of the particles interacted with the field in a way that slowed them down and gave them mass, while others continued to move at the speed that they were originally. This is, in the scientific world, this is a blockbuster discovery. This is a landmark discovery because this field that has been questioned, the speculation has been, does it exist? Is it there? We now know that it is, and it's given many names. Some people simply call this the Higgs field. Some people call it the field. Some are calling it the source. Some are calling it the matrix, as Max Planck. Some are calling this the divine matrix. And for the rest of this program, just to make it easy for our conversation, I'm going to use either the term the matrix or the divine matrix to describe the field that we're talking about now. So the question is, now we know that the field is there. This matrix is there. What does it do? How does it work?